The following interview was conducted with Jean Elizabeth Wilson Vaughn, class of 1948, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 15, 2009, at her home in Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning to you. Thank good morning you. And also, thank you. They're also sitting in is Stephanie Schmitz from the Archives and Special Collections. Let's get started with tell us where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. I was born and raised in Chicago, educated uh, in Chicago. I have an older sister who's 17 months older than I am. And um, she was a. Uh, in those days, they called it water ballet. Today, they call it synchronized swimming. She was not prone for competitive swimming. She wanted to do the water ballet. So we were both swimmers in our own way, but our own little category. Okay. What was uh, your early year in school? Where did you go to school there in Chicago? And then tell us a little bit about high school. I went to a grammar school called Barnard, Barnard School on the south side. And then I went to Morgan Park High School. Okay. And Any, then from there, I had I enrolled in Northwestern University in 1944, and I only had one year there when I transferred to Purdue. Okay. Tell us a little bit about high school, of course, and then you started your, were you, did you start swimming when at an earlier age than high school? Yes, yeah, started. My dad was a swimmer, and he taught my sister and I how to swim. But we learned was there how a to pool sw- near near where you lived, an indoor pool. Well, or? we had a summer home on Flint Lake, Valparaiso, Indiana. And he taught us how to swim when we were young. And because, you know, with water all around you and so forth, he said it was necessary. But I didn't start swimming until, competitively, until I was 12. Okay. And the interesting thing, the first thing I ever did competitively was dive. And from that day on, I never became a diver. I became a swimmer. And I always remember Dick Papengoose saying, you know, Gene, what divers are, they're swimmers with their brains knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, was there some compet- competition when you were in grade school then and high school as well? No. None? The, the, there was no swim team or anything in high school. There was a boy swim team, but not girl swim team. And uh, so the events that I swam in when I was 12 were started with the newspaper like the Chicago Tribune and some of the other ones and they were open events and in those days they didn't have age group swimming so as a 12 year old I was swimming against women who were 17 18 and so forth so you had to go with the pack I mean no no division and that was when they started age group swimming that's when swimming really came forth because the younger kids could be in the right age group and know that they had a chance in their own with their own peers and, right. and the group and things of that sort. Correct. Yeah. Well, how did you happen to just select uh, Northwestern? Did you do any? Did you do any swimming there? No, I selected Northwestern because it was close to home, and I could um, swim with the club I was associated with in Chicago because that's during the war. And the pools at Northwestern were taken over by the V5 and the V12. So they were not open to the students. So I would get on an elevated and go to the Lakeshore Club in Chicago and practice. But I didn't have a coach because all the coaches and guys and everything were serving in the war. Sure, that's right. Was this a a swim club, at a, a private club, a swim club, and was it indoor pool? Yes, it was an indoor pool, and it was a private club called the Lakeshore Club. And uh, so I was asked to join their team, which I did. And the interesting thing, right next door was an arena, and uh, they taught uh, figure skating. And I say to this day, if I hadn't been a swimmer, I would have been a figure skater because I took lessons there. But then the lessons got to be too expensive, and my folks couldn't afford the lessons. It was something like 5 or $10 an hour. So, but swimming, I didn't have to pay anything. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, then um, why did you? How, how come? The, why did you decide to come to Purdue? And tell us about your Purdue years, a little bit. I decided to come to Purdue back in 1944. I went to a national swimming championship in Kansas City, and at that meet was Dick Papenguth, and he had a diver with him, and I knew the diver, 
of course, you went with the chaperone. My mother was my chaperone. And the diver got sick, and so my mom took care of her because we knew her. And so Dick said, well, I'll work with you, you know, because he didn't have anything to do. So he started working with me at that national swimming meet, and that's how we got connected. And he was... He was at Purdue, though. He, he was, was at Purdue, at Purdue okay. right. And so he said to me, he said, Jean, I think you have great possibilities. I would like to coach you because you don't have a coach. So that was in 44. And I said, but I'm already enrolled at Northwestern, and I really want to go to school there. He said, fine, I'll tell you what you can do. You can come down to Purdue on the weekends when you can, and I'll coach you. So that's how it was left. So I went ahead and went to Northwestern and then would come down here and practice with Dick. Okay. All right. Very interesting. And then the after... Pool, now, this would have been in Lambert. Lambert Field House? The old the one. The old one. Not with the new one they have. No, 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 no. way. No, no way. Right. And... Um, I'm so, thinking for the researchers because if they come on campus now, we have our own natatorium, but the, right. Lambert is the one. Okay. But anyway, um, so when I did... So uh, Dick, uh, t after I had finished my first year at Northwestern, he said, uh, I'd like for you to transfer to Purdue. And I said, oh, Dick, I don't really think so. I said, I pledge a sorority up there, initiated. I love the school. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll get you a job. And if you like the, the university and if you like the city and everything, you can enroll in Purdue. So he got me a job at the Lafayette Country Club as a lifeguard because there weren't that many um, men around to do lifeguarding. And his daughter and I were the two lifeguards at the Lafayette Country Club. And that was in 1945. So that whole summer we um, were lifeguards for the pool. Okay. And it was an old antique pool. <laughs> interesting. So interesting that every week you had to send into the state um, a bottle of the the what? water, you know, to see if you would pass. And we never passed once until the week before Labor Day, and they said, we're going to come out and close your pool. Well, the pool was going to be closed anyway over Labor Day. <laughs> so we lucked out. But luckily, we didn't have a lot of ear infections or we didn't have any other problems. Yeah, it worked out okay. We had to dump the HTH in by a can. <laughs> Different. Oh. Yeah, now move on to the Purdue. So then you ultimately did come to Purdue. Yes. Okay. Tell us about your Purdue days and your swimming particularly. Okay. I uh, came to Purdue in 45 and got all my transcripts and everything, and I was in the speech school at Northwestern, so not all of my credits transferred. So I got enrolled in Purdue, and then Dick told me of the certain days that I was to practice, and I was going to practice with the men, men's swimming team. And I was so nervous, he said, okay, come on such and such a day at a certain time. And I thought, oh, golly, these guys are going to hate me. You know, be, you know, You're the only woman. I was the only woman. And in those days, the guys swam with no suits, no bathing suits. They swam in the nude. <gasps> So anyway, um, well, there were the, there was a, all all men. Yeah, it was all men. You know, even the assistant coaches, they were all men. So anyway, um, I knew that Dick would make the guys wear swimming suits and everything. And I, I thought to myself, how can I get those boys' attention? You know, to really like me. And I thought, well, I went out and bought a bathing suit, and I bought a, a beautiful one-piece red bathing suit. So when I came out into the pool and Dick introduced me, they all booed me. And then Dick looked at me and he says, Jean, do you know why? You have a red bathing suit and that's for IU. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. That was coming right. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So I was booed. <laughs> only because of the color. Uh, well, evidently, yeah. only because of the red bathing suit. Oh, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because I had a colleague when I first came and we went to the first football game I go to all of them but anyway she said to me don't wear red well, I, hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't planned to wear red anyway because it's not a color and I was going to wear Purdue colors and then right. she explained to me why <laughs> oh well then tell us a little about the swimming there weren't any other girls at that time no. that were interested in swimming nobody nobody was well D Dick uh, coached girls from um 
Indianapolis, like the athletic club and so forth like that. But I was the only girl swimmer on the team, but we didn't have a girl swim team. So I was really the first girl swimmer enrolled at Purdue. So, But then it, through our practices and so forth, um, on some of the events that we would do in practice, I could even beat one boy in my particular stroke, which was breaststroke, and he didn't like that very well. <laughs> and another thing which was so great, the word got out, and it was in the exponent and all the other stuff, that there was a girl swimming with the men over at, back, <laughs> over at the pool, you know. And then, it, were you familiar with that pool? The I pool? never saw the pool, but I know about the pool, and, okay. and so I'm familiar it with the pool. It had... Um, a balcony all the way around it and you you know when he'd have water shows and so forth he people would sit there and they had doors to open so when I got there Dick because they had to wear bathing suits he opened up all the doors you so know people so, could come so in. people come in and see what was going on and I had the honor of having our president of the university come watch me practice which was Dr. Hubdy right wonderful president and uh, Red Mackey, who was the athletic director, and Cease Isbell, Bill, who was the coach, football coach. So there were a lot of spectators, and Dick said to me, boy, are you bringing all the people in here to see you swim? I said, oh, they're watching the guys, they're not watching me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and we worked very hard, and... Were there any meets or anything? I mean, well, the meets were through the AAU, in which I would go to and participate in all American the different Association events. Of universities. But with right. the publicity, and you saw there where I was in these different magazines, started bringing women to Purdue. Not because they got a scholarship, but that somebody was interested in them. So when, after my junior year, some girls started to come to Purdue. So after he got a nucleus of some girls, for a, sw a girl swim team, um, he called his friend, who was a coach at Michigan, Matt, I forgot his last name, but anyway, to have a duo swim meet, but it would be done by Western Union, because we couldn't afford buses to go up to uh, uh, Michigan or any of that. So you had to have your starters and um, your timers and everything, and they laid out the events that we had to swim, and you, you did the same thing as they did with the boys' meets as far as scoring and so forth. So anyway, and then after you were finished, you had to Western Union all your times with the particular person who was swimming, and then they would add up the points to see who won. Well, we won. We got the most points, so that was the first swimming meet between the women's swimming team in Michigan. Well, what year had that been? Forty five. Oh or golly, 46, it 47 was, let's maybe. See, Forty. 46. I was there. Forty five. For say, probably forty seven. Okay. Okay. And that's when they started having duo meets, but by Western Union. You know, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. different. That's right. Sure is. Um, what was the campus like when you came? Were there still a lot of the people from uh, the veterans? Were there still some of those on campus when you came? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, and when I first came to Purdue, which is in 45, uh, the, the war, war was still on. Okay, okay. And actually, after, after the war, there were more. The enrollment of the freshman class was larger than the seniors because the veterans were here on the GI Bill. Right. Yeah. Did you? Um, where did you live on campus? We went. Did you, did you transfer the sorority that you were at? I North couldn't Bay? join the sorority because as a transfer, because when you transfer as a from another school, you have to make a certain grade point average. So I had to wait until I got my grades, and then you became a, a, what you call affiliated with the sorority. And the same thing with Jody. She had to do the same thing. Okay. All right. What was your major while you were here? Well, <laughs> besides the, swimming. Right. Well, see, in those days, you didn't have a liberal arts school. Quote, unquote, the science school was the liberal arts school. Humanities you, uh, and science and education, I think it was. Right. One time. right. So anyway, to make a long story short, I took what I had to take for your requirements, 
and then I'd pick and choose the different things that I wanted to do, like psychology and sociology and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically, I wasn't qualified to do anything. So when I graduated with Purdue with a degree of BS, a Bachelor of Science, couldn't do anything. You moved with sort of liberal arts. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. So anyway, um, so then that summer, summer of 48 is when, well, I, I have to tell you about the practices we had prior to the Olympic trials in yes. Detroit. There were, I don't know, I think it, there was a small puddle at the Elks Club. There was a, was a lake there, and Dick went and got some guys to help him to mark off 50 meters because an Olympic pool is 50 meters, and that's where we practice in this... Out there at the Elks. Out at the Elks, in this pond, and it was dirty. <laughs> it was a pond pond, right? It was a pond pond. So yeah. after you got off, you had to be sure and get a shower and wash your hair because it was full of dirt. Oh. But that's where we practiced. Were there any others from the team that were also participating in yeah. the trials? Right. From, from, from well, Purdue? and see, that was in 48, and right. we picked up a, a couple other girls, and then even the men were there too so we had a big group I'd say we had about 10 including the boys and girls and then Dick was in a rowboat using his stopwatch and he had other people helping him out so but that was uh, very interesting and challenging for you right Did your parents come down and, and see while you were oh participating? yeah uh -huh. and the the um, Olympic trials were, it was in Detroit in June the early part of June 1948, and you were told by the Olympic Committee, you have to have your passport, you have to be ready to travel when the meet is over with, because we will leave right from Detroit to go to New York and be processed. So everybody who went there for the trials... In had, Michigan, at Detroit. Yeah. Right, had to be, re they were, next stage was the London, right? Well, we went we went from Detroit to New York, and we were there three days because we had to be processed. And then we got on a boat and went to England. And then uh, we um, land, well, parked the boat or whatever you call it, and in Southampton. And then they bussed us to the Olympic area. And the women Olympic uh, swimmers and other athletes were boarded in a woman's college called Southlands College, whereas the men had their own village. Was the uh, where you were housed? Was it far from where the Olympics was taking place? Oh, we had to take a bus. It okay. took us about forty-five minutes. Okay. But see, the men were right there sure. where the pool was. About what was the size of the contingent? In your in the swimming, they came from other places other than Purdue, of course. This was all the people oh, that were going to participate. Oh, we're talking like up in Detroit. Yeah. Well, oh my gosh, they had for the trials. They had tons of different heats and all the events. Sure. But you got to remember, in those days, they only had three strokes, and today we have four strokes. So you had different distances and so forth, and then they also had the diving up there the men and women diving. Okay. So I couldn't tell you, but we had a big, big group. What was the uniform, what was your, uh, the outfits that you wore? Oh, I'll show it to you. Okay. Um, well, you can show me after it then. Okay. I'm, yeah. She's going to show that after it. Um, did, if you, if you made it to the trials, then you automatically would be going to the Olympics. So there wasn't any pre. Uh, yes. Oh. You had, you went to Detroit to try out for the Olympics. Okay, so some, did some not make the tryout? Right, lots of people. Okay, because they only took the top three in your event, and I won the tryouts in Detroit. And then uh, another Purdue girl who was on the team, she got I can't I think she got second. And then there was the other girl that came from Providence, Rhode Island. So those were the three breaststroke swimmers. Okay, okay. and that was the same in all the other events too. Okay, okay. Well, then tell us about the Olympics, what was that experience? Well, it was interesting because they had a boat. Did your parents, did any parents, were they able to come? No. Oh. Um, it was a, sh they call it a ship. It was called the SS America, and they had all the Olympians on the ship, which is unusual to have everybody together. This was a ship that was docked there? Yes, and we left there and then went to Southampton, okay. but... They arranged the ship so that there were different 
places where the athletes could work out. And they had a real small swimming pool on aboard ship. And we had to take turns because they put us in a harness to swim so you'd be swimming in one place so they could get at least six or eight swimmers in the pool at the same time. <laughs> and they time me, you know, you got to do this and so forth. And then the track and field guy would be running around the deck and, you know, working oh. out. All the events were on the ship practicing. <laughs> right. Interesting. Every, everybody tra practicing, <laughs> you know. So it was fun because you got to meet the other athletes who were going to the Olympics in London. And why it was so exciting was because that was the first time they were having the Olympics since 1936. They did not have the Olympics in 1940 or 44 because of World War II. So this was three years after World War II, and they had the Olympics well, in London. that's a good thing. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What kind of um, local publicity was there that uh, around here? The newspaper cover that you were, that Purdue was going to have some people at it? Yeah, okay. but not big coverage. You've got to remember in those days there was no television. Oh, no, no television. No. But they have the newspaper, and so yeah, that would be in the newspaper. There. Right. Yeah. And what about locally? Did the Chicago people pick the uh, papers? Pick yeah, up? actually, the Chicago papers did better than the local around sure. here. Yeah. You got the Tribune up there. Right. Sure. Uh -huh. Right. But um, the interesting thing after we were all on the boat and got to know each other. On the way over? On the way over, is by meeting all these different athletes, there was such a spread in ages. Like the youngest one on our team was a girl from Hawaii and she was 17. Our oldest was 27, a gal that was on a relay. And um, the same thing with the other events because they were all holding out for this particular Olympic because they missed it in 40 and, and 44. 44. Sure. So you had old and young, but everybody was great. We were like one big family, one big family. It was wonderful. Yeah, and you really got to know them. Oh, yeah. yes, very much so. And then I, one something I read, they didn't give, uh, you didn't get a medal. Uh, they didn't issue medals for the Olympics? Oh, yeah, they oh, did, did, but I didn't win the medal in oh. my event. Okay, yeah. okay. What do, Would you get a, a ribbon or something of that? Did they have the medals like they have now around that hangs around the collar or yes. on a ribbon? Okay. okay. But you got to remember, Great Britain, it was three years after the war, they had no money. So you're having the opening ceremony totally different than what you've seen on television today with all that hype and the Hollywood people sure. and the dancers. Did and they the, have, what about a parade? Did they, did you? Well, this is what I want to tell you, one of the most important things I'll never forget and to me the highlight of my athletic career. The, what you did, you lined up outside the stadium in alphabetical order by a team. The first team to go in is the country that started the Olympics, the Greece, and the host team was Great Britain at the end. And then here we are, the United States in the middle towards the end. And they did it different than they do today. All the women came in first and our men behind us. And then you had a flag bearer up in the front. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. And even to this day, I get teary-eyed. As soon as our team entered into the stadium and those people saw the American flag, they went crazy. They cheered and they carried on because it's three years after the war and they were very grateful that we helped them get rid of old, what's his name, Hitler. Yeah, right. And they kept, Wow, that must have been awesome. Well, it was, I started crying. I couldn't believe, you know, these people were still so great and I'm patriotic and they love us and so forth. It was great. I'll never forget it oh, as long I, as I would imagine yeah. that. Oh. And they kept clapping and clapping and, and the other thing, they were standing in the, the, the stadium waving American flags. Interesting. And so when the the English team was behind us, when they came in, they didn't get that kind of applause. <laughs> <laughs> they were all tired out from clapping, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> How much time did you have when you got over there before the actual Olympics started? Was there much time? Yeah, we had about a week. Okay, so you could do some practicing. So and we could in. do practicing in yeah. the pool. What was the facility like? The pool it was it was interesting in forty eight because it was an indoor swimming pool and it was a fifty meter straightaway, and they had the eight lanes, 
And actually, in those days, it was different because they had a portable um, floor that they could put over the pool and use it for other athletic events. Like many facilities could yes. do. Like you but, could I do mean, everything. for 48, we were amazed. Yeah, right. So. Yeah. Um, what then, how long did you stay over there? Well, let's see, we were there... Yeah. This was in what t month? Was this in June? We June? start well. August? Actually, got there in June. Okay. We were there till the end of June, and then we the American swimming team was invited by the United States Occupation Zone in Germany to go give exhibitions. So we flew from London to Frankfurt, Germany, and then toured the the zone where the Americans, the GIs, were in occupation, and they enjoyed that. Oh, I bet, yes. And then we had a, we were invited by the French to have a duo meet the Americans against the French in Paris, which was fun. And um, matter of fact, I, basically I was a sprinter, I wasn't a distance, and they had the 100 meter breaststroke, so I won that against the French. Very good, so, very good. You got quite a few medals over over time. Yes, uh -huh. they're there. Wow, that's yeah. very nice. So, and then after we um, left the occupation zone, they split us up in different groups, so we could go in France and go different places to give exhibitions. And mine was my group was in the south of France, which was great. And nice part of the country. Right. Real nice. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So then then we all had to meet at a certain time in La Havre, France, to get on a boat and come back. Okay. And was there people waiting when you got back? Oh, yeah. New York was crazy. Really crazy. You know, they finally got... All, everybody that was from the U.S. that was on, was on the same ship, I gathered. But not coming home. Oh. Some of them got to go home. Before, Either. they didn't, like, yeah. you went to uh, Germany and France. Yeah, okay. some of them didn't go do that. They had other commitments. Some of the boy athletes had to get back because um, they were in college and they were going to start um, football. And so we're talking about the track and field sure. guys. They were going to start football or do something else. Right. But most of them were on the boat going, uh, coming back. Yeah, that's nice. So we had a nice celebration. Yeah, that's right. And okay. then what came next in, in your career path after you got back? Did well, after I got back, uh, from matter of fact, it was interesting. Uh, it was a surprise. My mother and dad bought my sister a ticket to meet me in New York when the boat left. So we took a trip in New York and had a great time. And then I came back with her on the train. And when I got back to Chicago... You know, I hadn't applied for a job or anything. You'd already graduated. You had graduated. I had graduated. You. I graduated. Graduated before I went to the Olympics, and uh, I got a call from this man from the Patricia Stevens Modeling Agency, and he had read about me and so forth. And he said, "Jean, what are, what are your plans? Do you have a job?" And I said, "Heavens, no! I just got back from the Olympics." And I said, "I don't think I'm qualified to do much of anything." He said, "I'll tell you what." come down here to the agency, and he, he said, you can be a model for the Patricia Stevens agency. So I modeled for a year for them. I did photography, uh, fashion, and conventions, and I made good money. Oh, I bet you did. That's Probably right. more than if I had a job from Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, were you married? At, did you get when did, did you meet your husband then after you graduated or while you were No, there? I met my husband when I was a lifeguard at the country club. Oh, okay. And was we he, were married in 1949. Okay. Was he a student at Purdue? Uh, before the war, he was. And then he was in the war for three and a half years. But during that time that he was in the war, he got to, he was in that ASTB, ASTP program, and he went to the University of Nebraska and Kansas State, and then they washed that program out, and then he had to go into the regular service. Oh, okay, I see. But then when he got back, uh, yeah, he went back to Purdue, and he went back to Indiana, but after three years gone, he never got his degree because he didn't like chemistry and physics. So those are the two subjects he lacks. He's got tons of hours, but not enough two requirements to get his degree. Oh, okay. All righty. So, 
Well then, next let's talk about your career path and what did you do uh, after that? After you got married, did you, uh, where did you reside? Well, after I got married, then I got an offer from the sport and sport program. Uh, they traveled around sport, water and sport something where they go to different conventions and show off the fishing equipment and the sporting things. And like I was, outdoor something, outdoor. Yeah, sport, some, yeah. or outdoor sporting something. And they brought in a portable pool so I was giving demonstrations of strokes and so forth, and then they made me swim against the dolphin, which was so dumb because the dolphin would dive in and he's already at the end of the pool. <laughs> but it got their attention. Sure, right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> what, you know, some of the awards, and I know that you got that uh, Hall of Fame award, but you also got, you hold 10 American records for breaststroke. It's right. wonderful. And well, all the medals that you got up there. But see, those those were from 45 to 48 that I held all those records. And then, oh, years afterwards, a lot of them are broken. That's why you have records to be broken. Okay, right. Is there one particular meet that sticks in your mind that you, uh, as you look back, that one was really good, that you had sort of special things for it or... All of them were important, I Well, know. they were all important. Right. All the national ones were very important. Um, I can't really you know, a particular at anyone one. in particular. The Did thing, you keep up with your swimming over time, though, have you? Well, just for about a year, a couple of years, when I was doing professional with this water show type of thing. Okay. But um, my kids, I have four children, they're all good swimmers. All good swimmers. Okay. That's good. And moms can, can swim, uh, swim with them as well, right? Right. <laughs> well, my daughter, see, I have three sons and a daughter. She's the baby. And she was the only one who really pursued the swimming. She got a athletic scholarship from Coach Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama. That's where she went to school. Okay. Did your other children, come, any of your children come to Purdue? Yes. My son, uh, my oldest son is a Purdue graduate. And... Um, course I'm a Purdue graduate and that's something I want to talk about maybe later about that okay go ahead that's all right can I sure interject yeah it? that's please but do. I it's off this this part is off the cuff okay off the but we can record it is it okay or you well, want I don't to want it to be well just redone okay then we'll cut this we'll do this at the end then you can do that off okay the, cuff. the thing about it is I don't know how you feel about our new president. Is this okay? The recorder's on. Do you want to leave this on? No, I want it off. Okay. Because uh, I think the next thing I want to ask a little bit about is, um, do you participate in the Alumni Association? Oh, yes. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit uh, of the local as well, as yeah. the region too? Well, and of course my husband, even my husband, John, we're life members of the Alumni Association. Okay, okay. What about the President's Council? Have you been involved with We that? were involved in that, and then we had to... Uh, Turn, turn it down because my husband is quite ill and he actually can't walk without a walker and of course she didn't come in the front door. We have an electric lift to go upstairs. Okay. So actually you probably used I'm to go his, hair, his total care 24-7 and he takes a lot of care. Do you, you used to go to the football games and things I imagine? I still to, go to okay. the football games. Okay. Still go to. My okay. sister-in-law and I, Marge Vaughn Price, she and I go to and have for years. Okay. We've had tickets and everything, and that's one thing. I have to get a babysitter for him, but it's worth it. I love all the Purdue festivities and the band and everything to go with it. Exactly. I, I hear you. I've gone to. I've only missed a few games since I've been here, so right. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah, I yeah. love it. And uh, Tiller was he was interesting. So uh, I commented when they did that breezeway. They asked. Tiller about it. We said, well, I don't know, maybe I could be Tiller's turn or Tiller's way. I mean, he just had a great sense of humor. <laughs> he really did. He, he was, was very a great personable. Guy. Very great guy. I knew him, too. Yeah. And I loved his wife, Arnett. Yes. Great very, woman. Very. And uh, let's see, yeah. how about um, Chauncey Village? How's that? Uh, what was that like when you first came? Chauncey Village has changed a lot over time, hasn't oh, it? Oh, heavens, yes. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, people have shared different things like there used to be arts was there and a little post office and it's changed a lot over time and right. of course the whole levy has changed too right. 
Yeah. Well, and of course, when I was going to Purdue, the only drive-in was the Triple X. You know, you come in with the car, and they had car hops and everything, which was fun. Well, it's totally different now. Yeah, but the Triple X is still good. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's great. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how about an outstanding event? Do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Or more, well, I think I already have was that uh, opening okay. ceremony at the Olympics. Good. I mean, okay. see, uh, to this day, it gets me all choked up. And then the other thing, when we were in the field, you know, with all the uh, Olympians, they played the national anthem. And any time that's played now, I get choked up. It brings back those memories. Yes, exactly. And they do that at the at the game, too. That's kind of neat. And the, other, the other thing I like, too, at Ross, when they have the flyover, you know, I think yes. that's kind of cool. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? <laughs> it really is. Uh, the other thing I like is when they say, I am an American. I think that's wonderful. Right, that Roy Johnson does. Yes. Yeah, exactly. How about uh, um, any, any and, um, favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have a tradition that you sort of stick in mind, any Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Well, even today, I still wear gold and black when I go to the football there game. There you go. That's important. <laughs> there is no other color, right? No, yeah, that's right. Right, okay. So I have jackets, and I have all kinds of stuff, black pants and gold tops or jackets or whatever. That's no, right. I wouldn't go to a game unless I'm dressed for Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of it. That's part of being there. Yeah, right. right. I'm going to leave it with any closing or um as you look back and anything special you'd like to share for with the researchers, leave it up to you. Well, there are probably a lot of people that you should go visit, you know. We can get that afterwards, but just yourself, I mean, as you look as you look back. And, and were you gone from this community for a while and then you came back? Right. Okay. I that's see. when I, after the Olympics, and that's when I worked as a model in Chicago. Okay. And I was up there for a year. Okay. Then got married, and then came back here. Okay. Did, and, after you were married, that, so you raised your children here? Yes. Oh, okay. Matter of fact, um, we have lived in this house for 52 years. Very nice. Yeah. And it's close to a lot of things, too. Right. And, yeah. of course, the close to Purdue was so much going on. Especially the sports. That's right, exactly. It's right. good to be in the neighborhood, right? Right, it really <laughs> is. Uh, anything, uh, and a final thing, anything that you'd like to, or you think this sort of, sort of covers it pretty much for you? I think it covers it pretty much, uh, other than still, well, I don't want to talk about that. But okay. anyway, uh, just being part of Purdue. All these years. All these many years, and still being in touch with the different football players, and I really have enjoyed it. Good. I want to thank you very much. This well, thank you. Thank you very much.